Um, so maybe just to say uh, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the school's noon meeting. Uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Shannon Odell here to uh, 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 represent as a representative from the IPCM or uh, Interdisciplinary Palliative Care and Medicine uh, Division in our, our team. Um, and Shannon, I, I must say I've, I've I, I, I obviously I'm a uh, I'm privileged to have some some background info, <laughs> knowing knowing that you you your all your 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 many qualifications that you you have. Um, I mean, uh, so Dr. Dell, you 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 uh, part time involved with UCT uh, teaching and 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 research uh, supervision, um, but I know you also um, a practitioner. You're a palliative care practitioner in in Newark, no? If that's that's. Yeah, in the sort of false bay area. In the false bay area, excellent. And you uh, obviously have a, have a passion for palliative medicine because you've done the postgraduate diploma and the MPhil in palliative medicine through UCT. But I'm also very curious to see that you have a certificate of competence in advanced health ethics from WITS. Um, so that which which really is a is a is an important. Uh, uh, a combination uh, of, of knowledge and skills to have. Uh, I can imagine just for your own practice, but also for for the teaching activities um, and, and, and particularly the, the focus of today's talk. Uh, yeah. yeah, and maybe just to add um, the reason I'm I was happy to give this talk. I mean, I'm always happy to give um, to to participate, but I am also studying um, my master's in applied bioethics and um, my topic that I'm doing a lot of reading on is palliative sedation. So um, yeah, I'm really interested in it. Great, thank you so much, Shannon. And so, so over to you and then we look forward to your presentation. I'm sure there, there will be uh, questions and, and, and a conversation to follow from the, the presentation. Super. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks class. So yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity of presenting today. The topic um, I have been doing a lot of reading about is palliative sedation and the ethics governing its practice. Um, my objectives for today is I'd like to start by looking at the WHO definition of palliative care and then also at various definitions offered for palliative sedation, looking for congruence as well as further clarifying some of the common terminology used in palliative sedation. I would also like to spend a little time on the concepts of pain, of suffering, consciousness and hastening of death and end by looking at some ethical principles that help in my understanding of justifiable indications for performing or denying palliative sedation. Like the train in this picture, I would like to humbly put forward that my knowledge and my understanding and my experience are still in progress in this serious matter. So palliative sedation is the more recognized term used amongst peers. However, in the literature, several descriptive terms have been used which apart from confusing the intentions or means of the procedure, also make research and comparisons difficult. Here are some examples. Some use the term terminal sedation or sedation for intractable distress in the dying, end of life sedation, parsimonious um, uh, distress, terminal anesthesia, and even slow the euthanasia. So let's begin by defining palliative care as spoken about by the World Health Organization. They describe it as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial and spiritual. This is a very broad definition that does pose some predicaments in the indications and intentions of palliative sedation. Here we see the use of the phrase life-threatening illness. And we know from palliative care that the definition or the application of palliative care is right from the point of diagnosis and not just end of life care. And therefore we might have some confusion when we start using the term terminal. We can see in this definition as well that there's the use of the term suffering as well as 
pain, which will be discussed further too. In palliative care, we are always taught that pain is what the patient says it is, not what the doctor believes that it ought to be. And Dame Cecily Saunders, the doyen of palliative care, coined the term total pain to include and encompass physical aspects, psychological aspects, social aspects and spiritual aspects of pain experienced by the patient as well as their family. Sorry, give me a moment. I'm going to have to switch to this mode if you don't mind. So in layman's terms, pain and suffering are often used interchangeably. They are closely categorized in the medical literature. So too, as we've seen in the World Health Organization definition of palliative care. And pain is therefore a very subjective experience and should be respected as such. But the perception of suffering may require further interpretation. Castle points out that pain might be perceived as suffering when the pain is overwhelming, when the source of pain is unknown, when the meaning of the pain is dire, or when the pain is chronic. These experiences of pain may lead patients to catastrophize, feel their present life is out of control and devoid of their integrity as a person, and they may feel that their continued existence and future plans are threatened. Healthcare professionals might also contribute to the experience of suffering when the patient's pain is not validated, leading to the patient distrusting their perception of reality or the healthcare practitioner exhibiting subtle compassion fatigue, attending to patients with chronic pain and leading thus to further social isolation of the patient and perseverating their suffering. However, one must consider pain and suffering as being phenomenologically distinct. Being in pain, even great pain, does not necessarily imply suffering, nor suffering pain. Consider a mother experiencing severe labor pains who might view the experience as rewarding rather than suffering per se. If it were possible to determine the source of the patient's pain, alter and contextualize its meaning, especially with regards to the time that they are to endure it and the time frame, and if we are able to offer some control over the pain, then it might be possible for suffering to be relieved despite continued pain. We must also consider that suffering has a consciousness element. One needs to be conscious, conscious to experience suffering. Sedation for the relief of suffering touches at the most basic conflict of palliative medicine. Are we doing enough or are we doing too much? The European Association of Palliative Care is underway with a large multi-centre review of palliative sedation and these guidelines from 2009 are being considered. Sedation can be considered for patients with intolerable distress due to physical symptoms and a lack of other methods of palliation. Note here that they don't mention psychological, social or existential symptoms up front. Symptoms should be refractory after repeated assessments and continuous deep sedation should be considered only in the very terminal stages of illness with expected death within hours to days at most. Evaluation should be performed by a clinician with expertise in palliative care whenever possible, and evaluation should be multidisciplinary. Assessment should include estimates as to whether death is anticipated within minutes to hours, hours to days, days to weeks, or longer. And this introduces the concept of the fallibility of healthcare practitioners prognostication and the burden placed on healthcare practitioners to get it right. The patient's capacity sorry, to sorry, make sorry. decisions about... Shannon? Uh, yeah. Sorry, 
Uh, I'm sorry to interject. I don't want to lose you, uh, uh, your trail, but I, I, we just worried that you, your slides may, is not advancing. We're still seeing the pain suffering slide. Um, um, it sounds like you might be on the following slide already. Yeah, I am. <laughs> What's going on? I don't know if you put it in slide mode again. Um, sorry, I thought it was in slide mode. Can you see that? Go. Perfect. Thank, thank you oh, so, so much. Sorry. No, no, I wanted to. Technical glitches. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, thanks for bringing it up. Um, so the, these are the guidelines, as, as I was mentioning, about um, the, from the European Association of Palliative Care. Um, so we got to the point that we're saying we're estimating and we're prognosticating about the time the patient has left, but also to evaluate the patient's capacity to make decisions about ongoing care um, needs to be evaluated. And if decisional capacity is in doubt, evaluation by a psychiatrist might be needed. The level of sedation should be the lowest level necessary to provide relief of suffering. And here we introduce the concept of proportionality. Intermittent or mild sedation should be attempted first. And later in these guidelines, they make mention of psychological symptoms, noting that the presence of refractory psychological symptoms does not necessarily indicate um, a far advanced state of physiological deterioration. So sedation should be reserved for patients in advanced stages of terminal diseases when psychological symptoms should be designated as refractory only after repeated assessment by clinicians with psychological treatment expertise and those that have established a, a good relationship, a therapeutic relationship with the patient and their family and have attempted routine approaches to management. In rare cases where sedation is appropriate for psychological distress, they reckon that sedation should be delivered on a respite basis for 6 to 24 hours at a period and then with planned downward titration. And if continuous sedation needs to be considered, this would have to have been after repeated trials of respite sedation with intensive intermittent therapy in between. The other definitions of palliative sedation are given by the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Care, which says that it is the controlled induction of sedation, sometimes to the point of unconsciousness, to relieve severe refractory suffering of a terminally ill patient. The National Ethics Committee of the Veterans Health Administration in the United States defines it as the administration of non-opioid drugs to sedate a terminally ill patient to unconsciousness as an intervention of last resort to treat severe refractory pain or other clinical symptoms that have not been relieved by aggressive symptom-specific palliation. So we can see that in common to all these definitions of palliative sedation, there's the controlled administration of a drug, be it opioid or non-opioid, by a physician, that sedation of the patient is to unconsciousness or a degree of consciousness, the patient is deemed terminally ill prior to the sedation. The purpose being is to relieve severe refractory pain or symptoms or suffering, and that there is no other means to bring about this relief. Of note is that in neither the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Care definition or the NEC definition is the type of suffering clarified, nor is informed consent um, mentioned as well. I want to spend a little bit of time on some of the common terms used in these definitions. Refractory describes symptoms that are more than just difficult to manage or that might require unconventional or expensive treatment of the patient, or symptoms that cause distress in the family, the patient, or even the clinician, which might in the clinician's case be due to inexperience or, or operating beyond their scope. Labeling as refractory in such situations may prove self-fulfilling and subtly hint of therapeutic nihilism. Thus, one would objectively describe a symptom as being refractory when standard palliative interventions used aggressively and concertedly are unable to adequately relieve the symptom without inducing sedation. The anticipated acute or chronic morbidity of the intervention is deemed intolerable to the patient.
The proposed interventions are unlikely to provide relief within a tolerable time frame, and the patient's place of care is unamenable to further aggressive intervention. So very important coming through is the time and the place as well. Smith would go further and describe instances of refractoriness as being medically futile because the cure is impossible, physiologically impossible, the treatment is not beneficial or unlikely to be beneficial, or even where there is treatment, it is it might where treatment is plausible, it might not be validated yet in acting off sort of code or off procedure. Um, in some texts, refractory is substituted for intolerable, and intolerable suffering is obviously subjective. Um, as it would be determined by the patient as a symptom or state that they deem that they can endure or not, and they wish to endure or not. So that's intolerable for one might be tolerable for another. And an intolerable symptom may in fact be experienced when health is quite good or in relative health. So there are further difficulties with this description of refractory in that it doesn't necessarily imply that the patient's condition is far advanced or in fact terminal. The description of refractory might not be appropriate when the distress due to the symptom fluctuates, good on some days, bad on others. Thus, if refractory remains difficult to estimate or might require trials of therapy, Cherney concedes that it costs doubt on the issue of proportionality, which we'll discuss further. Examples of severe refractory physical symptoms would be pain, dyspnea or vomiting, and severe refractory neuropsychiatric problems might be seizures, agitated delirium, anxiety or depression. Severe social problems such as discrimination or rejection an existential distress due to loss of dignity or a sense of meaning in life may also cause severe suffering in a terminally ill patient, and they may respond at that stage to intensive interventions, including dignity therapy or psychological counselling or spiritual guidance and even some social interventions. Therefore, some might argue that refractory should not apply for psychological or existential distress, as there might still be scope for psychological adaptation and coping. However, this delay in conceding to refractoriness or the corollary that healthcare practitioners would determine when relief is adequate, which reverberates of paternalism, might subject those with psychological or existential suffering to drawn out trials of therapy offering inadequate relief. Relief, therefore, is surely a subjective quantification of the patient's ability to tolerate the pain or suffering, and thus is difficult to measure. And I will discuss further components in these definitions that are difficult to measure. We've seen in the definition and in the definitions used thus far that some of the terms, some use terminal and some say life-threatening. Some would describe genetic diseases, paraplegia, or even Alzheimer's disease as terminal illnesses. But these patients may still have an extended life expectancy of months to even years. Thus, using the term terminally ill as a criterion for palliative sedation may raise slippery slope concerns, broadening the application of palliative sedation to patients who are not in fact imminently dying and blurring the distinction then between palliative sedation and physician-assisted suicide. Some might argue that terminality imposes an arbitrary constraint and condemns these individuals to endure unrelieved suffering for a potentially long period of time. In the strictest sense, terminality is considered as being in the last two weeks of the patient's life, regardless of the diagnosis, where the situation is considered irreversible and the patient is proximal to death. But better yet would be the use of the terms imminently dying or proximal to death in favour of terminality. Estimating terminality those last two weeks might seem arbitrary, and we certainly have all got it wrong sometimes, 
but with clinical experience of the different disease trajectories and awareness of clinical features and signs, prognostication can be more informed. Consciousness lies on a spectrum from normal sleep and prescribing sleeping tablets to mild or deep sedation for surgery or wound changes. The level of sedation is proportional to the noxious stimuli, the um, intricacy of the intervention and the time needed to perform that intervention. So apart from sedating for noxious procedures where the reversal of the sedation is planned, unconsciousness is generally viewed as a misfortune requiring us to try and rectify it to restore consciousness. So there's a debate as, whether, as to whether the intentional lowering of consciousness until death be considered good or bad. Retaining consciousness may be considered good or valuable because consciousness is an important prerequisite to making choices and acting upon them, thus having autonomy as well as dignity. There may be value in being conscious at the end of life, opportunities for meaningful, reconciliatory, spiritual or personal experiences, but being conscious when experiencing refractory pain or delirium or neurodegenerative illnesses would not necessarily be good. Likewise, the value of consciousness for patients at the end of their life can be reduced. Unconsciousness might be considered bad or undesirable as a patient who is unconscious or deeply sedated is unaware of his or her surroundings and is then unresponsive to external or internal stimuli. It might be considered bad if it is thought to hasten death or lead to respiratory depression dehydration or loss of interactional function. There is a point for dying patients with impaired consciousness beyond which they can no longer meaningfully engage in any activity. And beyond that point, further sedation is not any more harmful or bad from the patient's perspective and is at worst considered neutral. The point in time is not easy to determine. This should be discussed with the patient, preferably, or the patient's family if the patient isn't able to discuss it, before the patient becomes terminal and a value judgment made on the cost being the waiving of potential valuable meaningful moments in the future. Therefore, mere consciousness is not of intrinsic value. It is the contents of the consciousness that makes it either good or bad and needs to be weighed at the end of life. Another aspect to consider is whether sedation relieves pain and or suffering or just eliminates the capacity to experience it. And we must be cautioned that deep unconsciousness renders the patient quite quiet and quite still. And one might have the false assurance that this is a good death or the patient is in comfort but we must consider that the patient is not so much comfortable as in a state in which neither comfort nor discomfort can be experienced. And I would further state that the initial distressing symptom must still be addressed as how are we to determine whether the patient is still experiencing, for example, nausea or not. The monitoring of ongoing sedation in dying patients using validated tools is an area that needs a lot more research. The WHO definition of palliative care, palliative care states that it is an approach that does not purport to hasten death, but consider death as a normal process. And there is broad consensus that when opioids are used appropriately and carefully titrated for analgesic effect, the occurrence of respiratory depression is a very rare event, but over caution for this rare side effect should not permit under treatment of pain at the end of life. However, the body of evidence pertaining to whether palliative sedation hastens death is actually of very poor quality, mostly due to the ethical limitations on research on this vulnerable population. In Sykes and Thorne's study, as well as Marita et al's work, they found no evidence of palliative sedation shortening life but others such as Quill, Lowe and Brock presuppose that palliative sedation may hasten death in some cases, 
Reisfeld suggests adopting a complete agnostic view in that we, don't, we do not know with utmost certainty whether sedation hastens death, and this is still to be debated. Death may be foreseeably hastened when the patient is not imminently dying, when they might have a prognosis of weeks to months, when nutrition and hydration are withdrawn or withheld. We know that dehydration associated with sedation often causes death within two weeks. Most of our patients who receive palliative sedation have already stopped eating and drinking and thus negating this argument. But it should be stated that the withdrawal of nutrition and hydration be, should be considered as a completely separate issue to palliative sedation and it involves a separate discussion with the patient or their proxies. In my view, there should be no absolute prohibition of artificial nutrition and hydration in patients receiving palliative sedation as long as the harms of these medical interventions do not grossly outweigh the potential benefits. So what are the indications for palliative sedation? Wayne described nine clinical preconditions for the consideration of sedation in the management of refractory symptoms. The illness must be irreversible and advanced and death is imminent. The symptoms must be determined to be untreatable and refractory. The goals of care must be clear. Are we aiming for death? Are we aiming for sedation? Are we aiming for the relief of suffering broadly? Or are we aiming for the relief of a specific symptom? Informed consent must be gathered from the patient or their proxy. Corroborative consultation should be sought. The staff should be involved and informed as appropriate. The family should also be involved and guided by the patient's wishes and the clinical condition. Full documentation of the clinical condition and medication um, needs to be uh, provided and there must be agreement within, this, within the, the team treating the patient as well as the um, staff that resuscitation will not be initiated once palliative sedation is initiated. The Oxford textbook qualifies the use of palliative sedation for existential suffering for only the most extraordinary circumstances, yet unsatisfactorily does not describe what those might be. The trouble with existential or spiritual suffering is that it is difficult to define, as well as to distinguish from treatable psychiatric conditions such as depression. There is no single agreed upon definition of existential suffering that is sufficiently clear and concrete to offer guidance in clinical contexts. Janssen and Sulmassi describe this type of suffering as agent narrative suffering, depending on the patient's belief about their underlying terminal condition, their interpretation and implications of their physical predicament. Some argue that the relief of existential suffering is beyond the scope of healthcare providers, even of medicine, and that pharmacological sedation for refractory existential suffering is disproportionate and thus not justifiable. Others might argue that refractory should not apply for psychological or existential distress, as we've mentioned, as there might still be scope for psychological adaptation and coping. However, this delay in conceding to refractoriness, we've said, um, and the corollary that the healthcare practitioner needs to consider when, a, when treatment is appropriate or there's adequate um, relief, is, is not acceptable. Existential suffering can be just as distressing as physical um, suffering. And um, we know that not all suffering though, even suffering that is equally intense, is appropriately treated by the same intervention. So what can we do for patients that have existential suffering, if not sedation? We can't abandon the patient, but a promising non-medical intervention, which I mentioned earlier as well, is dignity therapy, which is, trying to establish a sense of meaning for the patient, a sense of purpose for them, and still maintaining their self-worth during the stages of, of dying. The complexity and ambiguity of end-of-life scenarios requires very careful ethical deliberation, 
preferably making use of multiple moral frameworks and approaches. Most literature appeals to the rule of double effect for the justification of palliative sedation, but other ethical principles such as autonomy, intent and informed consent are also important to consider. The mentally competent patient should be informed of the possibility of palliative sedation if their circumstances warrant it and criteria are fulfilled. Ideally, this conversation regarding decision making should occur prior to the distressing symptoms becoming refractory. If they understand the intent of the intervention and the means by which it is hoped to be achieved, as well as possible deleterious side effects, they may voluntarily agree to undergo palliative sedation by giving informed consent. The healthcare prof professional should endeavor to obtain informed consent from the patient or healthcare proxy prior to initiation of palliative sedation. And like we've said during these conversations, the healthcare professional must also discuss the further implications of this decision with respect to other life sustaining treatment such as the withholding of withholding or withdrawing of nutrition and hydration, as well as CPR. As the patient becomes progressively more ill and nearing the end of life, they might not be able to exercise their autonomy due to cognitive impairment induced by their disease, by drugs or age related changes. As such, these patients may not be able to consent consent to or refuse further procedures or interventions such as palliative sedation. Refractory suffering also renders the patient vulnerable. Thus, to what extent can such a decision actually be, be an autonomous decision, even when the patient is not cognitively impaired? Can the patient be said to be exercising their free will if the physical suffering is so extreme it would seem that there is no other choice than deep continuous sedation. The healthcare professional should also reflect on what his or her honest intent is and consider how that might be identified or defined. Are there any covert thoughts to hasten death? Intentions are manifest directly in interactions with colleagues or in clinical notes and indirectly by observers making reasonable inferences on the choice and the usage of sedating medications, such as is there monitoring of the patient distress, are you titrating dosages appropriately, and are there other safeguards provided to ensure that there's proper patient care. The rule of double effect states that an action with two or more possible effects, including at least one good and one bad effect, is morally permissible if four provisos are met. One, the action must be must not be immoral, i.e. it must be moral, it must be legal, we can't want to kill the patient. The action must be undertaken with the intention of achieving only the good effect, or effects, and then we have that utilitarian weighing up of the benefits versus the harms. And the possible bad effects must be foreseen but not intended. The action must not achieve the good effect by means of the bad effect, and the action must be undertaken for a proportionately grave reason, the rule of proportionality. The act could be proportionate to the means employed where for, and proportionate to the end, what we're hoping to achieve, what we call means end proportionality. And we would look at that by, by titrating dosages. But the potential benefits are proportionate to the potential harms, the good versus bad, where, and we call that end end proportionality. The rule of double effect rests on a number of assumptions, though. It assumes that it is possible to distinguish an intended effect from an unseen, I mean, a foreseen but unintended effect. It also assumes the integrity of the physician having unambiguous intent and motive. In applying the rule of double effect properly, the intended 
effects must be carefully specified and the proposed intervention or means must be considered as being able to achieve those desired effects. And thus the relief of suffering as used in the WHO definition of palliative care is far too broad an effect to have practical clinical meaning in the context of the rule of double effects. Good clinicians use specific drugs to treat specific symptoms and under the rule of double effect can at times accept the possibility of loss of patient consciousness as a side effect of treating those symptoms. So if the good intended is pain relief and to achieve that opioids such as morphine are prescribed and the bad effect is potentially altered or reduced consciousness, given that reduced consciousness is not part of the means used, that is morphine doesn't have to have its analgesic function, doesn't get its analgesic function through reducing consciousness, then criterion three of the rule of double effect, which is that the action must not achieve the good effect by means of a bad effect, then the rule of double effect is adequately met. The benefit of a dying patient being pain free generally outweighs the reduced or altered consciousness. Therefore, in this scenario, it is straightforward, it is uncontroversial, um, and it's showing that reduced consciousness is caused as a side effect of analgesia, and this could be justified by this rule of double effect in dying patients. What about if the patient had refractory myoclonus and was imminently dying? The intention in acting would be to stop the myoclonus, which could be deemed moral. In order to do that, the means would be to prescribe benzodiazepines, which might need to be prescribed in increasing measure to achieve the intended effect of stopping the myoclonus. However, we might need more and more benzodiazepines and finally achieve relief of suffering, not by means of, per se, of sedation per se, nor by death, but the sedation is an unintended but foreseen side effect of the benzodiazepines. So to reiterate, we want to stop the myoclonus, we give the benzodiazepine to stop the myoclonus, which relieves suffering, but unfortunately the benzodiazepines in an increasing measure may lead to the bad side effect if sedation or a decrease in unconsciousness is considered a bad effect. Um, we may have that as a foreseeable side effect. It's a little bit complicated now. Um, and I need my notes to, to describe it better. So Quill describes proportionate palliative sedation. In this situation, we might have a patient who has agitated terminal delirium towards the end of life, and we want to sedate this patient. That is our intention, to reduce the delirium to sedate the patient. So straight away, if we're considering the provisos of the rule of double effect, we might be questioned whether sedation or unconsciousness is moral. In order to resolve or relieve the agitation of terminal delirium, we may need to prescribe benzodiazepines and other drugs. The effect of those benzodiazepines might be some level of sedation and some dissociation with the symptoms, which may or may not be a good effect. So here you can see that unconsciousness or sedation is considered both as a good effect and a bad effect, and actually they're the same thing. So if we're being very strict with the provisos of the rule of double effect, we're missing that it's moral, we're missing that there are two possible distinct effects, um, and you might consider that the bad effect, the unconsciousness, is leading to the relief of suffering, and therefore the third proviso of the rule of double effect is also not achieved. Therefore, we might think that the rule of double effect doesn't justify proportionate palliative sedation. But remember what I said before is that it's only one means 
of looking at these particular scenarios. If we can't justify it by means of rule of double effect, we need to consider several other moral frameworks and see if they apply to the situation. And one might consider proportionality as something to look at. Right, so with proportionate palliative sedation, as we've mentioned, the level of consciousness is maintained at which the relief of the symptoms is achieved. In palliative sedation to unconsciousness directly, unconsciousness is the intended goal of the sedation rather than just a side effect. And here where is where there might become some trickiness. Um, and when in, and in this state, we would keep the patient unconscious until death. So consider severe refractory bleeding or choking due to inability to swallow secretions. Quill describes this as palliative sedation to unconsciousness. So if we were to apply the rule of double effect to the case of terminal hemorrhage or choking, the rule states that the action must not be immoral. So here we know we're wanting a rapid sedation and we might question whether that decrease in level of consciousness is a good or a bad thing. Some may question it and therefore the morality of it is questioned. The proposed action or intended means, we're using something specific to cause sedation. We're using barbiturates or benzodiazepines or morphine with the intent to cause sedation, to cause rapid sedation. And whether sedation again is considered good or bad, um, we are allowing for the relief of suffering for the patient in those extreme circumstances. And I would think that proportionality in that situation is appropriate to consider as justification. But in terms of the rule of double effect, death might be the bad effect, which might be foreseen but not intended. But the good effect um, might lead to that bad effect of death. And some would say that in this situation, the rule of double effect, because those four provisos are not, um, are not uh, sort of ticked off, we can't justify this situation with, um, with the rule of double effect. Um, so again, our intention is not to hasten death in this situation. It's not to end the patient's life. And um, we need to consider other means, other ethical uh, moral frameworks in order, in order to, to think about this scenario. So if we think about voluntary euthanasia using the rule of double effect, here our intention is to hasten death. And obviously, you know, from, from a moral standpoint, from a legal standpoint, that is unacceptable. We can see the intention of the healthcare professional by the use, by the intended means that they're trying to, to, to achieve that means. Um, so the, the use of large doses, um, disproportionate doses of barbiturates or morphine or even something like potassium chloride or whatever, shows that the intention is certainly not proportionate. It is not just merely sedation. It is not merely relief of suffering, the intention here is in fact to cause death. And by causing death, we are then getting the good effect of the relief of suffering. And therefore, in the case of voluntary euthanasia, if we consider the intent of the action, the means and the effect, and of course the morality of it, we cannot justify voluntary euthanasia using the rule of double effect. And I think we'd all agree on that. So I think you'll have seen how confusing and indistinct the terminology is in the various definitions I've put forward. But I hope I've piqued your interest in further considering the context and the meaning of pain and suffering in your patients and the values they might place on being conscious or not, as well as challenged you to consider your actual intentions when deciding courses of actions. I hope that your approach to refractory suffering will not be nihilistic, but there would be engagement with palliative care colleagues on whether palliative sedation might be an appropriate intervention. And I hope you understand the rule of double effect a little bit better, as it can be quite reassuring in some complex situations. 
Lastly, I hope you will read up more like me on palliative sedation and think about contextualizing it to our clinical settings so that we'd be able to offer a reasonable defense to proponents of palliative to physician assisted suicide and voluntary euthanasia. But this is a vast topic and I've not considered or covered everything by any means. But thank you so much for listening, despite the different uses of technology and different devices. Um, but thank you for listening and for attending this meeting. Those are there as well. Thanks, class. Oh, thanks so much, Shannon. Uh... I can understand now why you needed to access those notes. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot to say. <laughs> and unfortunately, yeah, my mind uh, can't, retain, can't retain all of that all the time and to then try and explain it succinctly. So thank you for being gracious in allowing me to use my notes. No, of course. I, I, I really, oh, really enjoyed your talk and I I think you did really well in, in, in like you said, piquing our interest in, in getting to know more. Um, and also I think your advice about, about making it a team decision and, and, and um, including the patient, the family. I mean, that's that's uh, to make to, to, to deal with this, this tricky situation, which like, like I say, it could be a slippery, slippery slope. Uh, so to speak about and, and about in really interrogating one's own intent. Um, uh, I liked, I really liked that. Um, I want to open up the floor for any questions or comments. Um, maybe, maybe some of the information has resonated with your own experiences um, uh, uh, in these clinical scenarios, which are so often so difficult and, and complex to to manage. Um, so I see Jessica has, uh, has has made a comment about an interesting presentation. Yes, Renee, please go ahead. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I, I really like the approach that you say that many people have a nihilistic approach towards symptom control and therefore, therefore think that hastening death is the only approach. And I think that we have the philosophy of that there's always something we can do and really to include the dignity therapy. Um, I think we were just in a meeting now and looking at how few people are actually palliative care trained in the Western Cape and how much we still need to do really to reach out to more trained palliative care physicians if you get to a situation where a person feels hopeless with the symptoms that you are faced with. Thank you very much. Thanks, Renee. Um, and I, I really want to, to stress that we, we need to do more work on understanding palliative sedation and the ethical considerations regarding it because we will come against opposition when laws might change when public opinion changes towards uh, physician assisted suicide or euthanasia we need to know exactly what we are talking about what the indications are what the risks are um, so that we're able to have the competence as palliative care providers in providing safe effective justifiable palliative sedation to patients in those situations so i really think you know we need a lot of work to be done. Um, the EAPC is, is, I think they've they've put five years. Um, they in a, a long process of reviewing palliative sedation. It's a topical, um, controversial uh, discussion amongst palliative care providers, amongst legal um, people, and. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredibly interesting because it brings many philosophical issues to the fore. Um, it, it runs at the core of what a medical person is, what is our scope of practice, particularly when, when we consider suffering per se or existential suffering. Um, so we certainly need to grapple with these things and discuss them and learn about them and read about it more because I suspect we are going to be questioned more on it in the future. Thank you, Sharon. I see there are two hands. I think Johan was first and then Maylene. Uh, 
I thank you for an um, amazing talk. Um, I just want to clarify uh, or, or want some clarification. Maybe I misheard or misunderstood. Um, in a scenario like uh, I'm, I'm currently working in the COVID setting, <clears throat> and in terminal COVID, um, those of us who've been working in the wards, uh, the terminal phase of COVID can be quite a rapid onset, and the the period from onset to the, uh, the where the patient demises is quite quite rapid um the 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 th and the incidation will be uh, will be rapid like in the the hemorrhage uh, scenario you, you sketched i just want to cl clarify for my own understanding did you say um this this the, the theory of double effect does not apply or um just could you just clarify that because in that period the, you, you lose, unfortunately, like you said, a lot of the autonomy of the patient because of the seriousness and the 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 the, 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 the quick onset as well as the rapid progression of the disease. And you need um, often you need high level, a high doses of sedation to control the symptoms. Thank you very much. Thanks, Johan. That's such a, a very important scenario that you that you've asked. So I'm glad that when you mentioned you described it as terminal, you qualified it by saying that the patient is imminently dying. We're expecting that COVID patient to rapidly demise. And therefore, one might think that because the suffering is so intense and we have so little time, that proportionately we might need to do a whole lot more to get that situation under control. So when I said that the rule of double effect doesn't apply or justify that situation, it's in the fact that people might consider sedation not or the decreased level of consciousness not to be a good thing. But one could consider that that is the only means in order to um, relieve suffering in that patient by giving sedation. There is talk and um, there is a lot of, uh, um, what's the word, criticism placed towards palliative care providers and that we sort of drag our heels. We want to do things very slowly according to effect, according to effect, according to effect. Um, but I would say that there are some circumstances where we can't wait to do a little bit, to do a little bit, to sort of drag our heels. I think we, we're being quite cruel when we're doing that. Um, so it, it, it cannot be um, because of the, we're aiming for sedation, um, there's trouble with the rule of double effect, but I think the proportionate, proportionality is sometimes considered part of the rule of double effect, or it might be considered completely separate and by itself. Um, and it is very difficult to incrementally or titrate dosages and therefore your intent might be questioned when a situation is so dire. So also for someone who is being extubated, you know, a palliative extubation, we don't have time to incrementally give the patient benzodiazepines or morphine, which might act, take a few minutes to act. Those few minutes, the patient is suffering. And so I, my feeling would be that proportionately we could go towards um, direct to unconsciousness, but the rule of double effect has a problem with it. But that does not mean it is not justifiable. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Marlene. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you, Shannon. So I'm not really um, very familiar with the field of palliative care, but I, I am working with an NGO working with pediatric palliative care, Shannon, and just listening to you. So this is probably more a comment than a question. It just sounds that um, the, the issues that you addressing in the talk would be infinitely more complex in the case of children because they, well, some children are not old enough to make their own decisions and, and the, the layers of emotions that uh, that come with, with young children dying and with parents struggling with, with additional emotions that, that come with losing a child. And, but I just wondered whether, you know, there is thinking around how the scenarios that you do describe would have to be negotiated in the case of a young child in particular. Thanks, Maylene. I, th I think we need to consider the, the 
The suffering is irregardless of age or, or situation in life or ethnicity or, or culture or anything like that. So refractory suffering and refractory physical, psychological suffering, I think, can indeed be experienced by, by children. And thus, and, and of course, they might have be imminently dying. And, and so the, the complexity is there because we, we tend to get more emotionally involved in these situations. But I think if we, we f what's the nice thing about some of these ethical frameworks is that we can break it down. Would it be moral to do this? What is our intention in doing it? And our intention for the for the relief of pain or the relief of spasticity or things like that are all appropriate to the age, but they 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 follow the ethical framework, and therefore we we can justify the proportionate need to alleviate that suffering. But it's how we judge that suffering to be alleviated. Um, obviously, we always say that it's the patient's account of what is relief. The patient will tell you when the pain is better. But that is often not the case in a child, a very small child, and often not the case in someone who is imminently dying. And that's why it's so difficult, because there aren't many validated tools to assess the relief or the, the level of relief um, in those situations. Um, but yeah, it's such a good point. And, and I'm sure the, the pediatric palliative care uh, specialists um, would, would probably uh, explain, explain it far more than I can. But, but I can't see there being ethically much difference in, in how one would, would think about it. Thank you very much. Um, I see we're almost at the top of the hour. Um, I don't see any more hands or comments, uh, questions. Um, I think that all that remains for me to say then is to really thank you again, Shannon. Um, yeah, for, for, for sharing this, this amazing presentation, I think, and also for helping to create awareness. Um, for for the need for 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 uh, palliative care and also the ethical lens uh, looking at at, at the, the, yeah the how we can relieve suffering especially in in terminal illness um tandy i see your hand is there, is there a last remark from your end <laughs> yes sir i did step up a bit so i'm not quite sure if i missed um this question being asked but i really would like to know in south africa do you perhaps have an idea of how many cases of euthanasia have we had well, euthanasia is not legal, so <laughs> they, 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 it would be hard to have records of it. Um, I anecdotally discussing things with um, some colleagues and some allied healthcare professionals, even some families. Um, there's been, you know, the slip of, well, we just gave this da 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 da, -da to hasten death. Um, I've certainly had patients say, oh, my previous doctor gave me a pull that if something, something should happen, I can just, you know, swallow this and it would, would be the end. Um, so it's, it's certainly happening. There's certainly a sense that there is suffering or, or, or symptoms that are not being adequately managed by patients, particularly as they are dying. Um, but a number, I'm not too sure. Okay, and then one last question. Um, is it something you would, I guess, advocate for in South Africa? What, uh, just clarify, what you what you asking? Euthanasia to be legal. Um, I don't think euthanasia, the intentional hastening um, of someone's death, even if they are autonomous and really wish it, I don't think it can be a justifiable um, a practice. So no, I would not advocate for euthanasia to be legalized. Um, I can see circumstances where patients might consider that they have the right uh, to die. Um, 
and certainly argue that they don't that they shouldn't be forced to live. Um, but I don't think that's something that can be imposed upon the medical profession to to do that. So I would not advocate for euthanasia. Absolutely not <laughs> to go to become legal in South Africa. And that's why we need to understand palliative sedation um, so that we can uh, advocate that there is an option. And, and certainly in some of the big legal cases in the states where they disallowed physician-assisted suicide, it was because there was palliative sedation available. Um, some, I think in France, they've now allowed uh, palliative sedation and sort of said that it is the standard of care, that everyone has the right to palliative sedation. And some are cautious then that that might be the Trojan horse for allowing um, euthanasia to come about. So we have to be very, uh, very careful in how we go about it, very strategic um, and very sound ethically. And I think uh, we need uh, more discussion and more education on it so that we, each one of us knows what our intention is and what our understanding of our palliative, palliative sedation is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tandi. I see also your comment in the chat and you're very welcome. And I think it's such an important question. I wonder, um, Shannon or Renee, um, should colleagues be interest, interested to learn more or engage more? Uh, how would you suggest uh, that they contact you or reach out to you? Is it maybe by email or through our website? Um, um, yeah, I'm should I quickly pop my email address in the uh, the chat? Oh, that's a great idea. Yes. Because um, I think there's this there's clearly a, a need and a desire to understand this this uh, particular concept uh, more clearly. But but I think obviously also in terms of creating awareness around uh, what palliative care is. Um, I think there's some some maybe some mis, mis uh, interpretations about the role of palliative care, and like Renee said earlier, we are very keen to um, expand access to quality palliative care by by trained providers um, uh, and really incorporate it in our undergraduate, postgraduate, uh, as well as CPD uh, programs for for health healthcare professionals. So. I think we want to make use of this this uh, maybe slightly unsolicited uh, marketing opportunity to also encourage colleagues to to um, engage with Shannon and Renee and find out more about about uh, ways to engage and also to learn more about about some of these aspects. But I really also enjoyed today's conversation, which bridges that uh, into bioethics or, or medical ethics, um, which which. It's, it's, it's like you said, it's everybody's business. Um, it, it's, it's not something we can ignore. And clearly there, is, there, there are uh, some uncertainties around, particularly how to manage that, that terminal phase of, of our loved, loved, loved one's life and our, our, our patient's life. Um, and to make that a, um, yeah, to, to really help to co uh, end suffering um, in that phase. So, so thank you so much for enlightening us and for, for your time and in, in, in this uh, very, a well prepared presentation and uh, thanks also to everyone for joining us and and for those great questions um i wish you well yeah should we call it a day <laughs> thanks so Thank much class thanks everybody